humerus distal, supracondylar fracture 1, 3, dash M slash 3, 1, 3, and 4. Fracture management using 1.6 mm and 2.0 mm K wires. In this presentation, K wires will be used to demonstrate two fixation techniques for an oblique supracondylar fracture of the distal humerus, AO classification 1, 3, dash M slash 3, 1, 3, and 4. The techniques are the crossed bilateral 1.6 mm K wire fixation technique and the divergent radial 2 mm K wire technique. In the clinical situation, intraoperative imaging in the AP and lateral planes would be performed after closed reduction and following each subsequent step of these minimally invasive techniques. For children 8 years of age and under, it is recommended to use 1.6 mm K wires. For older children, 2.0 mm K wires are recommended, which provide higher stability. This fracture may occur in a young patient with strong bone. Shear forces lead to an oblique separation of the metaphyseal articular block from the shaft. The obliquity of the fracture plane can be directed either obliquely downward and medially or obliquely downward and laterally. The bone model shows a simple oblique extraarticular fracture, AO OTA classification 13-M slash 3-1-4. It can be observed that the main fragment is connected to the ulna by the periosteum, the ulna nerve is visible on the medial side, and it is an extension type fracture. Note that the bone model used in this demonstration does not include the radius. Upon completion of this exercise, you should be able to explain the indications for K-wire fixation of pediatric supracondylar fractures of the distal humerus, recognize the importance of anatomical fracture reduction in achieving stable fixation, perform the two different K-wire fixation techniques, describe the advantages and disadvantages of the two different fixation techniques, and recognize the potential limitations with both techniques in relation to the fracture pattern. The clinical indications include 1-3-M-3-1-3 and 4 fractures, which can be reduced anatomically to permit safe intraosseous K-wire fixation. Note, K-wire fixation is an adaptation and does not alone give sufficient stability for early functional rehabilitation. Contraindications include multifragmentary fractures which cannot be fixed with K-wires alone. The patient is positioned supine on the operating table with the arm either on an arm side table or directly on the draped C-arm. Positioning the arm directly under the C-arm guarantees larger and better image intensification quality of the fracture site and reduces exposure time to radiation. However, care should be taken to avoid damaging the image intensifier with instruments. The surgical approach to both the crossed bilateral 1.6 mm K-wire fixation and the divergent radial 2 mm K-wire techniques require stab incisions or a direct puncture with the guide wire at their respective entry points. In the clinical situation, closed reduction under image intensification would be performed on this type of fracture. With the humerus supported, the forearm, along with the distal humerus fragment, is pulled for two to three minutes. The fragment is manipulated in order to fully detach the fragment from the surrounding injured muscles and anterior periosteum. With the fragment detached, reduction begins using the intact posterior periosteum as a tension band. The forearm is used as a joystick and is flexed and pronated, thereby reducing the fragment to the metaphysis of the humerus. Observe that if the reduction is incorrect, the elbow cannot be flexed past 90 degrees. In this situation, the forearm must be straightened and pulled for two to three minutes more and the steps for reducing the fracture repeated. If reduction is proving to be a challenge, the olecranon can be supported by hand and the fragment positioned and reduced by manipulating the forearm. To verify that the fracture is correctly reduced, the forearm is flexed. 
In the clinical situation, the intact posterior periosteum helps in reduction and stabilization of the fracture when it is stretched while the elbow is flexed. Note that, as the periosteum is visible in this bone model, the correct reduction can easily be observed. Observe that if the fragment is translated slightly medially or laterally, the axis of the forearm is unaffected. In addition, slight medial or lateral translation can be corrected with relative ease. However, rotation of the fragment results in malalignment of the forearm axis to that of the humerus. Additionally, rotational failure results in loss of contact between the fragment and the main fragment surface. In the case of rotational failure, the protrusion on the proximal fragment is termed a rotational nose and indicates a rotational failure of 40 degrees on average. In the case that this rotational nose is observed on the proximal humerus, the malrotation, internally or externally, is in the region of 40 to 45 degrees. In both cases, rotational failure does not allow for sufficient fracture fixation. Malrotation is corrected by either rotating the forearm or the humerus, or extending or flexing the fragment in order to achieve a 30-degree angulation between rocker's line and the axis of the capitulum. Visually evident varus malposition should not be accepted. The carrying angle should be equal to the opposite arm. The crossed bilateral technique, using 1.6 mm KYs bilaterally from the radial and ulnar direction, will now be demonstrated. In the clinical situation, a small incision or a direct puncture with the K-wire is made over the planned entry points. The first K-wire insertion is planned with a centered alignment to the axis of the humerus shaft in the lateral view. This alignment will result in the K-wire entering the posterior third of the olecranon fossa. Note that the first K-wire insertion must not be aligned to the lateral edge of the humerus as this will result in the K-wire missing contact within the olecranon fossa, leading to an unsatisfactory fracture fixation. The crossing of both K-wires must be planned to occur above the fracture and centered within the shaft axis in both the AP and lateral views. Additionally, optimum fixation is achieved by planning K-wire insertion through both the lateral and medial columns of the olecranon fossa. Observe that the K-wire must not be inserted through the center of the capitulum, as this will result in placement outside of the humeral axis. In order to achieve satisfactory fixation from the radial side, the K-wire is inserted in the direction of the shaft axis. The bone model is rotated 180 degrees to visualize the medial approach. In the clinical situation, the K-wire entry point on the ulnar side is located by palpation of the medial epicondyle or with intraoperative imaging. If swelling prevents palpation, a small stab incision is made. The K-wire is placed directly on the epicondyle and supported by hand before being drilled in the direction of the humerus shaft axis. Clinically, the elbow would be in a more extended position in order to relax the ulnar nerve and prevent nerve injury. It can be seen as the path of the KY is towards the axis, there is no danger of injury to the ulnar nerve. The exposed K wires are trimmed and bent to 90 degrees, taking care not to loosen the wire in the bone. The divergent radial technique using 2.0 mm K wires from the radial direction will now be demonstrated. In the clinical situation, a small incision or a direct puncture with the K wire is made over the planned entry point. 2.0 mm K wires provide increased stability and this technique allows them a high level of insertion precision.
K-wire insertion is planned in a centered alignment in the lateral view of the axis of the humerus shaft. In the clinical situation, the axis can be drawn directly on the patient's skin to assist in orienting the path of the K-wires in the correct plane. Note that the K-wire is attached 5 to 6 centimeters from the drill. This provides better drilling accuracy and directional control. The first K-wire is planned from the posterior of the capitulum directed towards the medial aspect along the humerus shaft axis. The second K-wire is planned for insertion towards the humerus shaft axis, diverging away from the first K-wire. Note that the second K-wire will cross the first K-wire outside of the skin. Note that achieving initial purchase of the K-wire in the desired location may pose a challenge, as there is a risk of the K-wire slipping off the bone because the entry angle is very oblique the K-wire can initially be positioned perpendicularly on the bone and a small indentation created. With the risk of slipping addressed, the K-wire is then repositioned to the desired angle and insertion towards the axis is continued. Note that it is crucial that the K-wires protrude no more than 2 to 3 millimeters out of the cortex. Observe that the final radial monolateral divergent fixation is stable. You should now be able to explain the indications for K-wire fixation of pediatric supracondylar fractures of the distal humerus, recognize the importance of anatomical fracture reduction in achieving stable fixation, perform the two different K-wire fixation techniques, describe the advantages and disadvantages of the two different fixation techniques, and recognize the potential limitations with both techniques in relation to the fracture pattern.